Vice President of uh, Vice President for Student Services of AIU, Dr. Henry, Spirituality and Education and Research. Please give me a minute. Or college president, vice president, or directors. 
anyone who is supervising someone who is teaching is considered a leader. What is our intention in this presentation? Our intention is to suggest that leaders earn would gain if they intentionally cultivate the culture of spirituality. And I'm going to define spirituality all down the road. It argues that the effective leader needs more than a set of professional skills and a good strategy plan. And all those things are important. We need them to achieve a significant improvement. The leader's personal level of spirituality affects the effectiveness of their influence in their fulfillment, fulfillment of their multifaceted, fast-paced, interest responsibility. And that's where the difference is shown. Like that, but as the person is facing stress, they are challenged to consistently demonstrate to their constituents the key spiritual traits of patience, forgiveness, acceptance, honesty, and the spiritual fruits as defined by the Apostle Paul in Galatians. Being able to retreat in their spiritual realm helps those leaders to put things into perspective and to find renewed energy to keep under control the deleterious impulses of revenge, jealousy, prejudice, pride, selfishness that can sabotage the climate of the institution and paralyze the long-term improvement. Now I have a quote here from the California Education Department. I could have taken from any department, probably one the one here in Philippine also. But it says that a growing body of research shows that school climate, the atmosphere of the institution, strongly influences student motivation to learn and to improve their academic achievement. When school members feel safe, valued, cared for, respected, and engaged, learning increases. If the atmosphere is positive and people feel appreciated, they feel they can take risks and they can try things, they do more and they do better and students study better and give uh, me, uh, better results. And more than that, it helps avoid problems of addiction and violence when people are in a very comfortable environment. Spirituality and educational leadership. Usually whenever we say religion, I didn't say religion or purpose because the word religion now is, is becoming more and more a negative Word. Whenever we say religion, people think about worship attendance, <laughs> organization, structure, committees, system of beliefs, and all those things are important. Doctrines, formality. That's what people see as religion. And those who, if you think back in history, when you say religion, Christian religion, you remember crusade, inquisition. And now if you watch the news, last few weeks, ISIS, killing people in the name of God, violence, corruption, people using the, using the name of God to take care of their personal agenda. When you say religion, many people, even if they don't believe in God, that's what they think. People are, are taking advantage of people to do their own thing. But spirituality has a more positive, uh, it also refers to inner disposition. Humility, patience, respect, regardless of the religion, whether you're Muslim or Jew or Buddhist, everywhere, everybody appreciates patience, love, respect, and humility, justice, fairness, compassion, and those are deep spiritual values that are rooted also in our Christian faith. They even talk about spiritual intelligence. You are all familiar with uh, Gardner's multiple intelligence theory. But spiritual intelligence is another one that we are talking about. Not everybody has that gift to be able to 
understand and perceive what is spiritual. How would we define spirituality for the purpose of our presentation today? Spiritual person is the person led by the Holy Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience or long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And Paul adds that against such things there is no law. In other words, whether you are in Philippines or in America or in Africa, whether you are Muslim or Buddhist or Muslim, this is the God of man. As leaders, we need to have those spiritual qualities within us as we lead. And uh, there is what also I, I, I call negative spirituality. It's a negative load. When it comes, it's poison. The climate, it brings down the institution. Paul called them the works of the flesh. Hatred, jealousy, sexual immorality, envy, contention. And uh, John called them the love of the world. But it's the same thing. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And all these act like poison in the life of a leader. And they come out as selfishness, lack of self-control, lack of respect for other people, dishonesty, pride, corruption, anger, and all those practices undermine success and effectiveness and uh, poison the climate. Richard Exley, in the period of power, has a very interesting quote that I would like to share with you today. He says that the potential for the abuse of power is present in every one of us. Frequently held in check, not by true humility, but only by lack of opportunity. If we are given a little power, let the world beware. Alone, none of us is a match for its beguiling temptation, but together in mutual accountability, which does help, we can overcome. So he's pointing toward our conclusion, saying that as a human being, we are all frail and subject to weaknesses. But God is able to make us strong and produce in us the fruits of the Spirit so that we can be the effective leaders that we need to be. Educational leaders play a key role in setting the tone, establishing and maintaining a healthy climate in the institution. If the person who is leading, whether it's the department or the school, or if the person um, instills a climate of love, dialogue, understanding, it will reflect on everybody working in the building, from the students to the parents, everybody will feel the difference. But people cannot give what they don't have. To give, you need to help. That's why leaders need to find ways to nurture their souls, renew their spiritual strength, so that they can have something substantive to share with others. And the Bible tells us that Jesus used to get up early morning to spend time in prayer. And that's a good advantage we have as Christians. We can go to the source of power, to the source of spirituality, to become stronger as we accomplish our duty. When everything is going well, there is no difference between a strong and a weak leader. But when the testing time comes, that's when the difference appears. When there is conflict, when times to implement changes, a crisis, then it's not enough to apply rules. You cannot pull any book or any policy to say this is what we have to do. We need to sit down and from the heart, we need to come to courage to make hard decisions. To be fair and to be adventurous of the institution and to innovate, to create new paths, new paths and to make fair decisions even when it is difficult, and to establish the right priorities. Ellen White says, the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and noble Christian. And that also applies to a leader. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, 
gives three, mercy, humility, and fairness. And those are strong guys. And it's interesting that he didn't talk about keeping the Sabbath. He's not referring to the 2300 days. He's not talking about knowing the doctrine or learning verses by heart. He's talking about very practical, simple things that everyone, even a child, can understand. What is it to be fair? What is it to be compassionate? And what is it to be humble? And pride, of course, is the big enemy. A few years ago, I found a book called When Jesus Came to Harvard. It was a very intriguing title. And it is written by a guy, Harvey Cox, is one of the very, very famous author. And he has uh, uh, for the last maybe 40, 50 years, very well known. And uh, Harvard University was, was established as a religious school to train ministers. And you know, it's now 100% secular. There's nothing to do with religion. There's still the school of theology, but let's go and see. And they were not even there put any religion class as general education. For about 60 to 80 years, they didn't even dare to even offer. And suddenly, the idea was they should offer a class in religious values and education. And they asked Cox to teach that class. And they thought nobody would come and take the class. Well, to his surprise, so many people registered for the class. There was no room in the no, no space in the room. So they moved the class to a big, huge, what about five, six hundred people who come to listen to this. And among the people who came, Hinduist, Muslim, Jews, atheists, all kind of people came. And everybody wanted to know who is that Jesus that everybody was talking about. And they had a chance to present this class about Jesus. And, um, having a good discussion with the students and out of the class is that book that is published here when Jesus came to Harvard and the response that he had. So I'm referring to this book today just to say that as believers, as Christians, we should not hesitate or be shy about presenting our deep conviction. And people, it doesn't matter who they are, and what are their religions or their beliefs, even if they're not religion at all, everybody understands the spiritual person. So who would like you to be your neighbor or your supervisor? Is it Cornell or Joseph that we spoke about in the beginning of our presentation? I hope that all of us, as we lead in our classrooms, in our schools, in our communities, all of us can have in us that spirituality, the fruits of the spirit in our hearts. More important than the head knowledge, more important than the skills, integrity, spirituality, character, and that's what will make the difference. Thank you for your attention. We have two minutes for questioning. in your mind between spirituality and morality yes. in definition oh, yes. yeah. could you share what is the yeah, morality would be still set of rules uh, between the right and the wrong spirituality would be the deep conviction that you have in your heart uh, when things are not black and white uh, and I, I would prefer for example when I make the difference between morality spirituality and religion, I would compare, for example, the Pharisees and Jesus. Jesus was a spiritual person. The Pharisees were the religious people. <laughs> they are concerned about rules and doing what is right, but compassion is not there. Fairness is not there. So it kind of... Many people are good moral people, like the young rich, rich ruler, but the spiritual empty was not there. It is 
keeps the Ten Commandments, but there is no spirituality. Yeah. I'm just wondering, from your study, if you have any suggestions on how spiritual leaders can react and relate to those religious people who use every tactic that is not spiritual to try to defend what they believe is holy. Well, that's a big problem you have with religious people, because most of the religious people, they are sincere. That doesn't mean they are right. Like the Pharisees, like Paul, he was sincerely persecuting the Christians. And for him, yes, I don't know what he's like. He's why those people who don't believe, like me. He was a very religious person, but he was not a spiritual person. So it's very hard to handle religious people. And you can see that with the uh, Muslim extremists that we see now, and the Inquisition, and the Crusades, same thing. And within our church, we have the same thing too. We have some people who are very religious, but more spirituality. So, I believe it's through prayer. <laughs> prayer and patience, and ask the Holy Spirit to do what we cannot do. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Harry. We are presenting this certificate of presentation for presenting the paper entitled Spirituality and Educational Religion. Thank you very much.